Nuclear war and the environment. This is the approximate size of the uh, meteor. Not that struck Earth, but that Earth struck as it was moving through the solar system. Earth impacted into it that killed the dinosaur 65 million years ago. It was moving at an enormous speed, but it, it uh, is not that large. You can see here next to the skyline of an American city. So we're going to be looking at a range of environmental effects that would be created by a large-scale nuclear exchange. And you know, it, uh, measuring it, we're, we're describing an exchange in which you'd have 1 to 10 megatons of detonations, which means lots and lots of warheads. So there's basically five issues that we need to consider in terms of the effects of uh, so many nuclear blasts on the environment. First, the effect of ultraviolet radiation. A nuclear war will put 500 to 5,000 percent as much nit nit nitrogen oxide in the atmosphere as normal. This would cut the ozone density. Now, the ozone layer protects life on Earth from solar ultraviolet radiation. So we would cut the ozone density between 30 and 70 percent in the hemisphere where the nuclear battle occurred, which is more, most likely to be in the northern hemisphere, and about 20 to 30 uh, uh, 20 to 40 percent in the southern hemisphere because of the way the air currents work and the way that the equator basically to some limited extent isolates the uh, air currents. Individual ozone holes would last just a few hours because of the way the air currents uh, basically uh, move around. 60 percent of the damage will recover in two to four years and the rest will take uh, 20 to 30 years. In the hemisphere affected there will be a 300 to 400 percent increase in ultraviolet radiation and a 100 to 150 percent increase elsewhere. It was estimated that an atmospheric nuclear testing in the 1950s and 60s reduced the ozone layer by an estimated 5 percent. It's estimated that a 5 percent drop in stratospheric ozone will cause a 5 percent increase in skin cancer, uh, particularly among pale-skinned people. Now the map below is not very easy to read, but it shows uh, where nuclear weapons were tested. And the Americans tested uh, some of their nuclear weapons, not in Nevada, but in the, uh, the southeast, if you can imagine that. France tested their nuclear weapons um, heavily in the Pacific, but also in Algeria. The British tested some of their weapons later on in the U.S., but the, the earliest British tests were conducted in Australia. Both Pakistan and India tested their areas in the desert. The Pakistanis tested it in sort of the frontier area of Balochistan, and the Indians tested there in the Rajasthan Desert. The Chinese tested theirs mostly in Lop Nor, in Xinjiang province. The North Koreans have a, a mountain where they, they test it. Uh, the Russians have tested it in a number of different areas, including you can see Novaya Zemli on the top of the map where they tested the Tsar Bomba, the largest bomb ever tested, um, but all, mostly in Kazakhstan. Now, the Israelis tested their bomb at uh, Prince Edward Island, which is an island halfway between South Africa and Antarctica. And it was a South African possession, probably a part of a quid pro quo for an exchange of technology. An observation here is that countries test nuclear weapons on indigenous land because uh, basically the, the first people that live in an area when they're occupied by uh, uh, people that were originally colonists or eventually conquered, they're basically not going to grant these people a political voice. So Algeria couldn't say no, uh, neither could the Kazakhs or the Uyghurs um, or the people who lived uh, uh, in and around um, New Mexico where the Americans tested their nuclear weapons. And the French uh, and the U.S. of course tested heavily in the Pacific and a lot of people there were um, uh, just uh, deported. Uh, to another island and haven't gone back. And there's plenty of litigation and interesting uh, historical cases on how these communities have fought back. So it's something to consider and it's always an interesting paper topic. So the effects are an increase of the cancer rate by at least 2%. Now the resulting loss of 50% of the ozone for three years would increase the rate of melanoma and skin cancer by 3 to 30%. Uh, it would re reduce the immune system, exposing the population to epidemics. But of course it'll also kill bacteria. Ultraviolet radiation damages chlorophyll production, which is 
the essential uh, chemical uh, operation in photosynthesis. So it would reduce germination rates in plant life. A tenfold UVB will kill the following crops. Peas, onions, white animals like, like pigs, uh, uh, beans, tomatoes, sugar beets, and lettuce. Crops, crops that are more robust would be soybeans, corn, barley, and alfalfa. Now there's been a lot of analysis of global temperature and a lot of the uh, current concern with the heating of the planet uses models that were originally used to examine the impact of nuclear weapons on weather and temperature. A 6.5 gigaton nuclear war will produce 360 teragrams or trillions of grams of dust from fires uh, of which 65 to 70 percent uh, teragrams will be soot which is from the fires produced by the nuclear blast. The dust will reflect light from the sun, cooling the Earth's atmosphere and surface. Now, by comparison, in 1960, you had about 14 gigatons of nuclear weapons available to all powers. So a 6.5 gigaton nuclear war, I think, is a realistic number of the number of weapons that would survive to be used. 30% of this dust will be taken to the stratosphere, where it will remain for a very long time. After 30 days, 75% of the dust uh, will return to the surface. Temperature shifts would last up to a single year. In less than 10 years, the natural equilibrium would have returned. Now, weapon yields of less than one megaton surface or optimal uh, airburst, but not high airburst, will not have a sufficient cloud height to put significant dust into the stratosphere. And therefore, it, you know, it's not going to affect uh, the, the radiation of the sun uh, getting into the atmosphere. The global effect will be a nuclear fall in July. Right? The latest research is that it would be a 5 to 15 degree Celsius change rather than the 25 to 30 uh, Celsius degree change estimates of the early 1980s. And you'll see that discussed uh, in articles in your reader. You can see here the predict predicted change in the surface temperature uh, after a nuclear exchange of approximately 6 uh, gigatons. Here you can see temperature uh, effects resulting from different amounts in teragrams of dust put into the atmosphere. So uh, you're looking at, at 180 teragrams, which is the worst. You're looking at a uh, um, 12. Yeah, you're looking at you know temperatures in July down to 12 degrees, which is pretty serious. You're lo losing about 15 15 degrees there minimum. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, you know, even at 60 teragrams, which is one third of the amount of dust, uh, you're, you're looking at still uh, an 80%, 90% change in temperature. Now plants that normally resist a minus 50 degree temperature, like a pine tree, for example, in Canada, will die when they're um, five degrees below zero in the wrong season. Because of course there are cycles, these. Um, plants go through to adapt. Tropical plants, of course, have a very limited ability to survive low temperatures. They have no dormancy mechanism. So uh, societies near the equator that grow food that uh, is of tropical nature um, are going to see a lot of their food sources die. Prolonged darkness uh, produced by dust will kill phytoplankton productivity. And this is going to this is going to kill the eco cycle in the oceans. A large part of the world feeds themselves by fish. So there's going to be a problem with uh, uh, takes of, of fishermen. Here you can see a fallout map of North America, which I've shown you already, and particularly Europe, uh, where you're going to have, which is much more densely populated, and um, uh, the fallout has a bigger, uh, well, it has the same footprint but on a much smaller area, and so you'll have huge areas covered in radiation with uh, essentially nowhere to go. Uh, if there's disruption of the monsoon in South Asia, then you could have mass starvation. So societies that get their water, not from meltwater coming from the mountains like the Nile, but depend on monsoons to uh, uh, essentially refill the ecology with water are going to suffer severely. So let's do a natural comparison of the effects of large-scale events on society from non-nuclear events. So we're going to try to 
draw some conclusions from these large-scale disasters to see what happened to uh, human civilization. So first we're going to take a look at events that were less than a 10 gigaton nuclear war. All right, so events that are less than a 10 gigaton nuclear war. On June 30th, 1908, an enormous detonation left an indelible mark near the Podakemenaya Tunguska River in the Siberian region of Russia. An estimated 80 million trees covering more than 2,150 square kilometers were completely flattened. Uh, there was an object about 50 meters in length that expo exploded in the atmosphere at an altitude of 6 to 10 kilometers above sea level, sending a blast of heat and shock wave with a likely energy equivalent of around 10 to 15 megatons of TNT. Now, I've looked at different sources, um, but I, I, the conventional wisdom is, is, is that it killed two people, where other sources have said it killed no one. But I believe the two people that were killed because they identified someone that was living there and they couldn't find them. In 1883, uh, the Krakatoa eruption, west of Java, what is today, today Indonesia, it's, it's sort of on the, the junction between um, Sumatra Island and Java's island, produced a 50 million tons of dust, 50 teragrams. The effect was a one degree Celsius decrease in the temperature of the entire planet. In 1815, you had the Tambora des detonation. Uh, another volcano uh, just east of Java, on the other side of Java, and it produced 150 cubic kilometers of magma, rock, and soil. Much bitter, bigger by an order of magnitude than Krakatoa. Uh, the effect in Indonesia, is it actually blew an entire island up, and then it wiped out 90% of the population on an adjacent island. And when I mean an adjacent island, I mean an island with hundreds of thousands of people, not a small island. The effect globally was a one to two degree Celsius decrease in global temperature with disruption of the jet stream in the Atlantic and a cold spell for a single season uh, in 1816 in Europe and North America. Now what you see here is a picture of uh, Mount St. Helens when it erupted in 1980. I was a child, I saw it, ha I didn't see it happen, but I saw it in the news. And I got up one morning and I went outside here in Montreal and everything was covered in snow in, in the, uh, well, I think, I believe it was um, uh, uh, the summer. And uh, it looked like snow, but it was warm and it wasn't melting. It was a layer of volcanic dust. And everyone was out there with brooms uh, uh, sweeping it um, off the sidewalk. Uh, into the sewer system, which you know we realize is not advisable because you can create cement out of this stuff. Cars had this on them, and you had to brush it off with a broom. So it's like snow, but snow that would be there forever. It wouldn't melt unless you went there and physically removed it. It was absolutely astounding. And it took a very small amount of time for it to get all the way uh, across to Canada. Now you can see in the other graph the uh, total megatonnage of U.S. nuclear weapons between uh, 1950 and 1984. And you can see uh, the, the yield in megatons and how it just shot up. In 1960, the Americans had 19,000 megatons. And those were those 10 to 15 uh, megaton uh, bombs I showed you, which were essentially uh, refrigerators that would be dropped out of the uh, B-36 uh, bombers. The total U.S. Uh, US tests uh, done to date are about the equivalent of 100 uh, megatons. They, the Amer U.S. did a lot of, of tests on some islands uh, and then that were very large uh, atmospheric tests and then they did a lot of underground tests at Nevada that were much smaller and intended essentially to test the components of the warheads and not to see how much of a bang they could produce. They got most of most of that large-scale detonation analysis done uh, in the Pacific. So there was 100 uh, uh, megatons equivalent testing done in the Marshall Islands and 1 75th of that done in Nevada. The Soviets uh, tested 456 nuclear devices at Semipalatinsk in Kazakhstan. Of course, you know, someone else's country. Here you can see uh, the dust um, that it, uh, caused a temperature change that resulted from the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption uh, and the resulting ash, tra uh, ash trail from uh, the Philippines. So let's take a look now at events that were of the scale of greater than a 10 gigaton nuclear war. And let's start with the 10 kilometer across diameter uh, 
asteroid that hit the Earth 65 million years ago, producing 500,000 teragrams of dust. That's 1,400 times more powerful than a 6.5 gigaton nuclear war. It's like it's 1,500 nuclear wars occurring in just moments. Obviously, the result was mass extinction. So it uh, uh, came down uh, in what is today the Yucatan, and here you can see um, uh, what I think is some sort of a sonic attempt to reconstruct the crater, which is located uh, partially under the uh, waters of the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, what you had was an asteroid that was 6.5 kilometers in diameter. And it, wasn't, it didn't actually hit the Earth. It was passing through the solar system, but the Earth impacted into it, which sort of tells you how fast the Earth is going. So this came in at a very low angle towards Mexico from the south. So it came in at a very, very steep angle, uh, not, not perpendicular, but almost parallel to the ground. And uh, it came in at 70 kilometers a second. It created a crater that was 3.5 uh, kilometers off the coast of the Yucatan. And here you can see uh, where, the, uh, where the impact occurred. Here it's the Chicxulub uh, crater. Now those white dots are cenotes and um, they, they're basically uh, underground gas pockets that were on the rim of the crater. And the crater was so hot uh, those uh, gas pockets expanded in a sphere spherical fashion, creating these underground caves. Now, for the Mayan people that lived there, they thought these caves were fascinating and uh, holy, and so they they buried their dead there. And uh, the the uh, pyramid at Chichen Itza is actually built on top of a cenotes, and a lot of these cenotes are incorporated into um, some of the uh, religious um, and mystical architecture. Uh, in, in the Yucatan. So one of the hints uh, about the Chicxulub crater was the fact that you had this very obvious ring of cenotes, indicating that there, you know, this, this is a circular object and there must be a center to it and there's some interest in what caused um, this particular structure. So we have here a picture uh, from one of my students. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Uh, who went to uh, Chichen Itza. I subsequently went to the exact same cenotes and I recommend you do as well. So there are cenotes that are exposed to the atmosphere and to the surface uh, all around um, the site. But there's one large one that's subterranean over which they built uh, their pyramid. Uh, and it indicates uh, that, that, it, that this had a serious uh, ritualistic role in their society. So putting this in context with other macro events, the largest ex extinction that we have on Earth was caused by a much earlier event. Uh, it was the early oxygenation of the atmosphere by aquatic cyanobacteria. So there was life on Earth a very long time ago. And the, this life on Earth actually um, created, uh, excreted oxygen. So oxygen is actually like urine. And uh, oxygen had a toxic poisoning effect on these, this early life form. And so that life form eventually poisoned itself and it died. Uh, a new life form emerged um, that was able to survive uh, by breathing oxygen. And it eventually evolved into us. So we are breathing the waste product of a previous life form that was basically um, wiped out. Now, there was a lesser uh, extinction event, um, which was the destruction of the trilobites 440 million years ago during the Ordovician. It's speculated because of the, the, the lack of other, other reasons for the death that it was probably done by a gamma ray burst uh, and subsequently created the uh, formation of ice ball Earth. Now, what, what is the, what's a gamma ray burst? Well, when you have a star that's very, very heavy, uh, it, the, the gravitational pull will cause it to collapse. And in, in sort of a series of sequences, it'll destroy all of the different elements. Somehow, it manages to not explode into a supernova because it's not large enough. It just simply collapses into a super dense object. And then at some point, 
uh, even the atomic nuclei break down, and you're left with a planet that's basically a neutron star. It's basically nothing but a solid, packed, mega-heavy, tiny collection of, of neutrons. Um, it's, it's just you know incredibly dense. And these things spin like nuts in a circle. And the heavy gravitational pull pulls in matter from other nearby objects. But this thing is spinning so fast, and the objects are, are being pulled in so quickly by the enormous gravitational pull, it can't fit in there. You get the same effects with a, a black hole. And so when the material comes in, um, it sometimes uh, uh, gets thrown out because it, 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 it basically end up with a, with a traffic jam of material trying to come in. And the material is thrown out along the two magnetic poles, which are incredibly strong. The, the, the magnetic poles of, of a neutron star are enormous. And so you have jets of material that are thrown out on the on the, the top north pole and the south pole. And uh, sometimes the jet, these jets are accompanied by uh, gamma ray bursts. So it's, it's thought that um, uh, a gamma ray burst uh, uh, probably hit Earth. I mean, that's a, that's a trillion to one odds because the universe is so big that a gamma ray burst would, would hit us. Um, but, you know, it's happened recently. In 2015, a gamma ray burst was detected uh, having passed near Earth. And it was estimated that um, it's from uh, six billion uh, kilometers away. And it killed enough life that it changed the chemistry of the Earth and the Earth became covered in ice. And then very slowly, um, much later, uh, volcanic activities uh, basically returned Earth to a non-ice state. But we're talking Earth was completely covered by ice, completely covered. Um, it was, there was no terrestrial exposure at all. The whole place was covered in frozen water. The second largest mass extinction was 250 million years ago. It's the Permian extinction. It was caused by Siberian coal beds that were torched by volcanoes. And this put sulfuric acid into, uh, into the atmosphere. Now, tear gas that the police use when uh, people demonstrate, that's basically um, a, a chemical that becomes acidic when it mixes with water. And again, you know, I spent my time in the military and we were constantly being gassed in gas chambers uh, you know, to prepare us for being nerve gassed by the Soviets, uh, but subsequently discovered that uh, it's actually carcinogenic. So they don't do it in the gas chamber as much. They do it more in the open air and they try to do it less because um, a sulf sulfuric acid, which is basically tear gas, does burn tissue and it's very unpleasant. So the sulfur uh, mixed in with the water and it wiped out uh, marine life. So 90% of marine life and 70% of terrestrial species that depend on the ecocycle of the oceans died. We then had the Triassic extinction of 201 million years ago, and this was caused by volcanoes that broke apart the continent of Pangaea. Um, and it created the ecological niche, which is good. It, it killed off a whole bunch of life, but, but the new life that emerged were uh, the dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs weren't always there. They were created by opportunities um, produced by the Triassic extinction. Now, in the era of humanity, uh, there was the Toba volcano eruption. 70 to 80,000 years ago, the collapse of a lava volcano on Sumatra, which is now in Indonesia, uh, basically spread chemicals and ash over the entire surface of the earth and called, caused uh, a, a severe extinction of terrestrial species. Humans were reduced down to less than 10,000 individuals and as low as 600 individuals. The entire Earth contained only 600 uh, humans from our particular species, Homo sapiens sapiens, right? At this time we had uh, Denisovans, Florins, and we still had and Neanderthals. So those other guys were still hanging around. Homo erectus was long gone right, as an independent species. They probably evolved into us anyway. Um, uh, these uh, Homo sapiens sapiens uh, were um, basically living in East Africa at the time. And this is a period about 10,000 years ago before humans uh, departed Africa. So this is really the beginning. We were, uh, we were a, a species under the risk of extinction. And we somehow managed uh, against odds uh, to make it um, here. It's actually not a, not a bad not a bad showing. Um, we've only been around for maybe 200,000 years, maybe 125,000 years. It depends how you interpret 
the, the genetic evidence. The genetic evidence is, by the way, how they came to the awareness that uh, people were, were um, uh, through, going through a genetic bottleneck about, um, about 75,000 years ago. And you can do that by looking at um, the changes in the haplogroups, which is the DNA in women in the mitochondria, which is the energy, energy producing bug that's trapped um, uh, as a symbiotic uh, creature in, in all of our cells. We get that from our mothers. And the uh, male Y chromosome DNA. Those, those, two, those two DNA sources change very slowly uh, and, and only very few thousand years. They're incredibly stable. Uh, unlike our normal DNA, which is you know switched in and out all the time, because um, the mitochondria clone themselves. Where humans, we you know we, we cut our DNA in half every time we transmit it to the uh, uh, to the next generation. So animal growth. Well, atmospheric fallout will decay to very low levels by the time it gets to the ground. Fallout consumed by mosses or lichen will enter the, the, the eco-cycle. Because animals, a lot of animals eat the mosses. In the southern hemisphere, you're probably looking around 30% of the northern fallout going there and then going on the ground. Nuclear war may produce a decrease in precipitation, which would be, of course, catastrophic for food consumption. If a 90% loss in female breeding stock happens, it'll take 11 years to rebuild the beef and dairy cattle numbers to initial levels, seven years for sheep, one year for pigs and six months for poultry. So it says something about the kind of animals that the government want to focus on. The chart here is a nucleotide decay chart. When uh, elements that are uh, radioactive um, decay, they can decay different ways. Remember, it's probabilistic. And so this is one of many different paths that plutonium can follow in its decay. And you can see here radon, right? One of the early ways that plutonium can decay is into radon. And that's, you know, the, the substance I mentioned earlier that comes up through the earth and gets into people's homes. Now, plant growth. Toxic smog and acid rain uh, produced by nuclear detonations will poison flora. Uh, precipitation may decrease within continents by altered weather patterns. Fires may lead to massive soil erosion and desertification. So some of the effects. 2.5% of tree surface in North America will likely be killed by fallout, especially conifers. That's about 2.5 million square kilometers. Yeah, trees are vulnerable to radiation. A 50% drop in fuel in the U.S. economy would produce a 25% drop in farm productivity and a 100% loss in pesticides and fertilizer will lead to a 16.5% loss in output. The U.S. Uh, system of agriculture is dependent on uh, natural phosphates like guano or phosphate minerals that are imported from Morocco as well as artificial phosphates. Our agricultural is, is heavily dependent on these fertilizers. And so not having a transportation uh, would significantly reduce our ability to produce food to survive. Now, based on the Bikini fallout experience, the Bikini is an eight hole in the Pacific where the Americans conducted nuclear tests, land could be tilled 12 months after radiation. All right, I'm not entirely sure what that means. I don't know how safe it would be. Now, so you do have to ask the question, um, what is the, the, the doomsday potential of a 6.5 gigaton nuclear war, you know, as, as it would affect our species? This is very hard to predict using uh, meteorological models. Now it's possible you have a cascade failure of the ecosystem because of, of sort of synergi synergistic uh, effects that accumulate, all right? And then you get step level failures. Um, the minimum secondary effect is that there are hundreds of millions of people, if not a billion people that depend on food brought in from outside, Saudi Arabia, uh, China. Um, they would be cut off from the international agricultural system where most of the food is imported um, and so you would have mass starvation. Starvation has been the number one killer of humans uh, forever. Um, uh, when humans die of disease, um, a large part of that could have been avoided if the population was healthy. So you, you normally find that, that plagues, not all plagues, but many plagues are associated with other crises like wars. Wars happen, they disrupt the food production system, people don't eat, and then, and then they get wiped out by large scale diseases that otherwise uh, wouldn't have had the same um, uh, effect on society. Um, 
So here's a demographic map of the world at the bottom, and you can see some places like the uh, east coast of the U.S., Europe, China, India, the Russian part of, uh, of uh, Eurasia, Nigeria. Um, the Rio Plata is are very heavily densely populated and would be vulnerable to a nuclear exchange. This is the uh, past uh, and the estimated future growth of our population. So, uh, you know, not to be cynical, but, you know, we, we, we've come from a very low level before. Humans were not uncivilized in 1850. Uh, well, probably more civilized by the time they got to 1900. Um, but, uh, you know, we did well in 1900 with 1.65 billion people. And now we're a multiple beyond that. So, um, not to make light of it, but what would really change if we lost 80% of our population? Would, would we actually lose something? I guess on the individual level, uh, we have this we have this peculiar observation that you can't create mathematicians but mathematicians do so much for us they almost randomly discover things and then push our ability to do things better um, in you know in a, in a sudden leap uh, you know people like uh, Newton for example or Archimedes um, who worked initially and and discovered intuitively some some of the uh, formula that come out of integral calculus so uh, we would lose those people certainly but you know these are questions we have to look at because um, uh, what are you willing to risk to protect your society when you decide to use nuclear weapons here's another uh, projection of uh, the growth of populations you can see the massive growth particularly in Asia obviously that that's looking at India and China and other countries in South Asia and again it's possible but very unlikely um, the direct effects will probably be greater than the indirect effects, but you're still going to have uh, huge effects. Uh, here, you know, I'd like to again point out, and I, as I do in different classes, the, the Bronze Age collapse. The Bronze Age collapse occur occurred about 1100 BC, and it was a simultaneous global event where, for reasons that are not entirely clear, uh, the entire planet de-urbanized. Now, China wasn't that urban. Uh, around 1100 BC. Now, you're looking at the Shang Dynasty, you had a couple of uh, uh, cities like Zhangzhou, for example, um, that had walls, uh, earthen walls built at the time, earthen and brick walls, um, but you didn't have a heavily urbanized society in China at the time. Uh, in, in, in Pakistan, South Asia, you had, of course, the uh, Indus uh, civilization, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. Uh, in Iraq, of course, you had the Sumerians and the Akkadians. And you had, of, of course, uh, societies that lived along the eastern Mediterranean coast. And, of course, you had Egypt and the Minoans in Crete and the Mycenaeans on the mainland and the Hittites um, in what is today Turkey or Asia Minor. Uh, and then for some reason, uh, we have an apocalypse that occurred. Basically, invaders came uh, in the European context, uh, sea peoples, and they seemed to... Uh, land in some places and it was difficult resisting them and Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa basically disappeared at the same time as the Aryans who were uh, semi-pastoral people came wandering in from southern Ukraine now uh, you'd like you could blame invaders I think um, whenever you see pirates like the Vikings or the Saracens or the Hungarians you're basically looking at weak societies having to deal with gangsters so the world was gangsterized and, and, and harassed by gangsters around 1100 BC, 1100 years before the Common Era. Um, and I, I think the explanation is ecological. You had something happening in the environment. Uh, the food supply dropped dramatically. The first thing that will end will be cities. So you had massive de-urbanization. So people didn't write, they starved. When people uh, didn't write things down, we, we just don't know what happened to them. And um, uh, then come the gangsters and then comes the disease. And so the Sea Peoples and the Aryans and their effect on whatever happened uh, in the Indus Valley, um, I don't think was that important. I think the, the, these societies were already dying. So the question is, can we have, um, uh, uh, can we survive that scale of a future Bronze Age collapse instigated by a nuclear war? Now the Bronze Age collapse killed uh, civilizations. It didn't kill, it didn't kill humanity. Humanity went on. Uh, in, in the Near East, it, it actually created new cultures. The, um, uh, the Greeks, the, who were, you know, the, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans turned into the Greeks of today, and genetically, you know, they're linked to a different culture, although the Greeks did have some prior memory of their, of their pre-Bronze Age uh, past. 
Um, the Egyptians were the only people that survived to record what happened, and so they are witnesses of the Sea Peoples. They recorded the events uh, before and after, so they're really the witnesses of this whole period. The Canaanites uh, became the Jews. Uh, the Lebanese at the time uh, became the Semitic peoples of the Eastern Coast, became the Phoenicians, and then there was a burst of activity that defined the Classical Age. So, um, the, the Chinese then urbanized uh, quickly in, the, in the, the Zia dynasty, which is not really a dynasty. The, the Shang culture and the, the, the Xia culture are really just cultures. They're a common language, a common, a common cultural understanding, which allowed a different political units to, to, to sort of interact, um, but it then led uh, several hundred years later in China to the Warring States period and then, and then the formation of Qin into Zhangguo. And in South Asia you had a movement of people from the Indus Valley into the Ganges Valley and you had the, the creation of, of kingdoms like Magadha. So things were rebuilt, obviously, but um, was it doomsday? No. Uh, the closest we came to, to mass death was the, the Toba uh, detonation uh, in Sumatra in 75,000 years uh, BC and, and that had a doomsday potential for us, but luckily it didn't happen. These are slides that I used to use for a quiz, but I erased the quiz, but I want to show you the slides because I, I use them to distract the students while they were writing the quiz. This is an airplane uh, designed by the U.S. Air Force that um, used a nuclear engine to generate the heat to operate uh, jet engines. Uh, and you can see the jet engines on the extreme uh, far ends of both wings. And it was ultimately replaced with ICBMs, which are seen as much more cost effective. Uh, the engine managed to work without releasing too much radiation because it had a closed system, which was basically a coolant made of molten salt, which was designed by the engineers working on this. And it had uh, many other very interesting technical features. And yes, the Americans managed to get it to work, but the airplane never flew solely on those engines. Power. The engines uh, worked uh, uh, nonetheless uh, when the aircraft went into the air. This is a V-2 rocket, German A-4 rocket, that was assembled in, in the underground bunkers around Harz Mountains in Germany. The uh, Germans used uh, slave labor, particularly priests from uh, concentration camps, uh, both uh, Catholic um, and evangelicals that resisted Nazism to assemble the rockets. Um, many of the rockets that were built by them were done so poorly that eventually the program was cancelled and the Germans just returned to having uh, loyal German Nazis assemble these rockets. Um, so here you have an American MP who's uh, standing guard by one of these rockets. Um, von Braun was the head of the German uh, rocket program and he was a general in the Schutzstaffel, which is the SS, the organization headed by Heinrich Himmler, which was the bodyguard of the Nazi party. They conducted the um, the uh, Einsatztruppen uh, genocides in Eastern Europe, as well as operating the concentration camps. Their job was to protect the, um, the state and the party against the uh, German army. And uh, Werner von Braun at the end of the war was engaged by the Americans to share, uh, in exchange for immunity, his knowledge of the rocket program. And of course, he, he was ahead of it. So um, he then went to work for NASA and he was instrumental in designing the Apollo 11 rocket um, that helped land Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon in uh, 1969. The Americans were curious whether they could launch a A-4 or V-2 rocket off an aircraft carrier. So here they launched a V-2 off an aircraft carrier. It worked. This is a uh, Aleutian 28 German, uh, uh, Russian uh, light bomber. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they were deployed in Cuba. They were not armed with nuclear weapons, but they could have been. The Chinese used them into the early uh, 2000s, and they were constantly, constantly uh, being used by defectors who would crash them into farmer fields in Taiwan. Useless piece of junk. This is the Goose, which uh, NATO terms as the uh, Black Jack. Uh, it's a strategic Soviet uh, bomber, long range, high speed. It's basically a Soviet copy of the American B-1B, but it came out about uh, 15 or 20 years later than the American version. Um, it's not a poor aircraft, um, but uh, a, a flying wing system is much better for stealth, low observability. This is the American Northrop early concept of the flying wing from the uh, 1950s and 60s. 
uh, and it took a long time to fly this thing because you can't fly it as a human. You can't you can't fly it uh, um, without constantly changing uh, the flaps. And so it wasn't until you had rapid uh, uh, computer controls that could fly the aircraft for you that the um, the B-2 bomber became a practical idea, which is the uh, now the main strategic bomber that the U.S. uses, primarily because uh, flying at night, uh, they cannot be seen by radar. And radar is the uh, principal non-optical way to detect things at a distance, so they can't be shot down. 